Assalamu alaikum, Khawatim Nasrat. We are getting into lecture number 25 of Marketing for Nonprofits MKT 628 at the Virtual University of Pakistan. And Wasim Hassan welcomes you to the lecture. The component of learning at hand is going to be how public relations complements the marketing effort. A lot has been said about public relations and marketing. And we have seen that uh, the public relations the basically complements the marketing effort and it is a part of marketing. Marketing is all encompassing. The PR is something that really lays a very well padded ground for marketing work to build on it. How does it do that? That's what we're going to look into. And um, the fact is that the PR function basically is uh, very vital to the very two uh, initial uh, stages of uh, the behavior change model. So in other words, it uh, helps a lot in terms of creating awareness among all those publics the way with whom uh, PR people are in contact. And we know that uh, the publics that are in contact with the PR people are governmental agencies, international agencies, and the media in particular. There are other publics as well, but um, the function basically relates to uh, working with uh, these two important areas. They create awareness among uh, all those agencies that uh, are uh, supportive to the cause and they influence their attitudes so that the marketing people can pick up the threads from there and start executing their strategies so that they can have their target audiences graduate from the earlier two stages to the remaining two stages of the behavior change model. Here, when PR people work with their audiences, there is one job they really do very well, or let's put it this way, they should do very well. And that is the job of classifying the audiences they are dealing with. They classify uh, their audiences essentially as uh, the primary audience, secondary audience, and tertiary audience. The difference among three audiences uh, is that uh, the primary audience or the audiences are the ones with which um, the organization is uh, in contact uh, almost uh, on daily basis. If not on daily basis, say very frequently. They can be your clients, uh, your um, other stakeholders who are involved very deeply with the programs. And um, therefore, uh, they happen to be the primary audiences. Uh, secondary audiences are the ones that uh, are not uh, interacted with um, very frequently, but then they happen to be of uh, a lot of um, supportive uh, character and uh, they uh, help the organization toward accomplishment of uh, its mission. And like I said, governmental agencies uh, could be uh, a, a good example of uh, the secondary uh, public. The tertiary the public is the one uh, that is uh, not in contact with uh, the PR people as a matter of fact, PR people um, do not uh, contact these uh, the audiences because they know that uh, they do not really have a direct impact on the working of the organization. The question is, uh, why is it that uh, they classify them as tertiary? Because they think somewhere down the line, these audiences are or maybe of some help to the organization and to be very cautious, and to be um, proactive, uh, PR people uh, take uh, such audiences into very serious consideration and uh, keep them uh, in store in, in, in a way uh, so that uh, they can draw upon that resource whenever need be. They may have to run into them 
in order to get their support uh, to make uh, their objectives uh, meaningful and achievable. And we know very well that their objectives are to uphold the image of the organization. Uh, although we have learned that uh, the PR has exceeded the limits of uh, uh, image perception of uh, the function and uh, they are uh, now into uh, mission accomplishment uh, which uh, basically um, involves uh, you know public advocacy and that's why uh, we call the function public advocacy but the fact remains that uh, the basic function of uh, upholding the image of the organization or um, trying to ward off a negative propaganda uh, or negative advocacy does happen to be a very important part of the overall job of the PR people. And therefore, they have to uh, keep uh, a complete record of uh, all the three uh, categories of uh, their audiences, meaning the primary audiences, secondary audiences, and tertiary audiences. Now, here, the next question is, uh, why do they keep the, such a classification and draw uh, such distinctive lines? It is because they have to be very clear about which are the audiences that are going to have a positive image of the organization and which are the ones that have a neutral image or have a negative image of the organization. And if the image is negative, that is where their job really gets very challenging because they have to uh, counter that and uh, they have to look into things like um, uh, what really are the reasons for that uh, negative uh, perception or negative image of the organization. There could be two reasons for that. The one is it just happens to be a matter of the perception and if that is the cause then the PR people know they have to do something with uh, communications and the positioning of the organization. So they go back to the marketing people, uh, telling them about uh, their observations so that marketing people can put things right. Uh, they look into things like whether it is a question of not having right communications in place or is it a question of uh, not um, kicking off uh, right communications to the right audience or Everything is in place, but they have not communicated at all because they have been thinking all along the line that their noble cause will automatically connect them with the audiences. So this is an important role played by the PR people and this is how they work in conjunction with the marketing people, making the marketing more effective. The second uh, reason or cause for uh, the negative image of the organization could be uh, the real performance. And uh, if that is the case, then uh, that is an extremely serious matter. Uh, and the fact is that uh, the PR people uh, cannot be of a tremendous help there because uh, there is something wrong with the credibility of the organization. If the performance is not up to the mark, and the interest of the audiences is not put uh, in uh, uh, precedence of uh, the interest of the organization, then the organization is not really uh, working for fulfilling its purpose. So in other words, it is uh, working very counter to the mission uh, of the organization. And um, therefore, it is here that marketing department along with other departments uh, really come into active uh, play. Uh, they, this is where they uh, pick up the threads from the PR people and uh, they diagnose the whole situation to pinpoint uh, where uh, the actual ailment lies. Uh, they, is it that uh, there is something wrong with the programs or uh, they, is it that they have serious problems uh, with the resources or is it a problem of uh, the staff demotivation and so on and so forth. So whatever the reason is, the performance of the company has to be turned around. And uh, the PR people can be helpful in this kind of a situation to the following extent. Number one, they, because of the relationships they have cultivated with the media, can be helpful uh, in uh, having the media um, say something uh, in favor of the organization by giving the organization the benefit of the doubt. And uh, the second thing which uh, the PR people can do 
uh, is uh, to uh, start giving interviews and uh, the placing stories, uh, real uh, substantive stories uh, in the newspapers about uh, the, the, the problems that uh, they have faced um, over uh, the period that caused you know, that kind of a problem. They've got to be very smart and subtle in talking about uh, the reasons for those ailments. But the fact is, they cannot really give a spin to the facts. They cannot make false statements. Either they have to be very uh, to the point and uh, precise while they talk about those factors or they may not talk about those uh, factors by way of giving those interviews. Um, the, the best thing in that situation could be that uh, they can have the media on their side, uh, which may not pick up the negative things and start um, uh, propagandizing uh, those uh, things uh, among the audiences. That's the best thing which can happen to the organization by the intervention uh, of uh, the PR people. Now, there are uh, a couple of more things that uh, PR people uh, can do to help uh, the marketing department. And uh, one of those is uh, they can be very helpful in uh, trying to uh, get the pinpoint those tools at the experiential level uh, that are uh, most compatible with the audiences because they are the ones who are in contact with uh, the many audiences, if not with all of them. Um, and because of their exposure to a couple of uh, very important audiences, they really uh, can um, be uh, helpful in um, uh, making uh, the marketing department aware of uh, the compatibility of certain tools uh, with the objective and with the purpose of the organization. Or I would say the positioning and the personality of the program. And that, I think, is a, is a great favor to the marketing department. And the fact is that uh, uh, their um, job uh, does carry the certain overlaps. And uh, here you see the overlaps are not to be uh, considered as uh, something negative. Rather, they are to be considered as uh, uh, something continual uh, on the uh, spectrum of um, PR and marketing. It starts to see with the PR because uh, we uh, say that uh, the PR deals with the first two stages of the behavior change model and then you know, takes us through that model all along that spectrum. And uh, therefore, it is kind of a continuum on which uh, the both operate. Um, the uh, initial kickoff is given by the PR people. Here, let me pinpoint uh, this uh, fact that um, in large organizations, you can have two different departments, uh, i.e. Uh, marketing department and the PR department. Uh, but in many other medium-sized to small-sized organizations, uh, you have just the one department, and that is the marketing department having also got some PR people. Now, the question is, if the organization happens to be very small, where... Um, uh, it cannot really afford to have the PR people, then I'm afraid to say the, the marketing manager or the person responsible for marketing has to uh, put different hats and uh, execute the responsibilities of the falling in different domains, meaning the PR domain and the marketing domain. It may also happen that uh, an organization is small and it is new and it doesn't really have a marketing manager. And then the founder or the chief executive could happens to be the uh, marketing uh, chief officer or the marketing manager. And that marketing manager also has to take care of the PR matters. And this is how organizations uh, develop initially in the formative period in a very informal way, which uh, finds its way into formal, uh, structured, uh, the organizational um, setup uh, as and when the, uh, the whole setup grows. Another um, area uh, where uh, the PR can be very supportive is uh, the event management. Uh, marketing people may not have time to be out uh, in the marketplace uh, trying to contact all audiences uh, because they want uh, their message to go across uh, all those audiences. 
And like we know very well by now that PR people uh, lay the ground uh, for uh, so many different marketing activities. This is one of the activities they are very good at creating. They are in touch with um, such publics that are uh, helpful in uh, uh, creating such events. And uh, with the help of those audiences, uh, they let the marketing department of their organization uh, organize and manage the events and uh, the work for uh, accomplishment of the, the mission. There is uh, the yet another aspect which is very important uh, in terms of PR people's help uh, the, to the marketing department or for that matter to the organization. They bring the organization earned advertising and that is a concept that I have talked about already and we know very well that uh, earned advertising is much better than paid advertising because mostly nonprofits are not in a position to afford the level of advertising uh, which PR people can bring uh, free of cost to the organization. So in other words, if uh, the value of that advertising, may that be in the print area or may that be um, in the area of uh, the on-air um, is greater than the value uh, which the organization in the first place could have afforded, then the PR people have done a great job. In other words, if the organization could have afforded just about uh, 500,000 rupees and uh, the PR people have brought to the organization advertising that aggregates to something like rupees 1 million, it is double the amount which the organization could have afforded in the first place. And in the second place, that money is now not going to be spent on advertising. It could be diverted to some other important activity toward uh, mission accomplishment. So this is a huge challenge with which PR people uh, meet and uh, they are really good at that. They, they keep um, on the move the most of the time. And uh, let me uh, point out here that uh, the marketing people and many other people within the organizations are at times, or rather most of the times, are critical of their uh, frequent movement because they are away from the office most of the time. And it is during those times that they develop those relationships. The uh, result of uh, those relationships appear later in an exponential way. All of a sudden, you realize the results which are far beyond the expectations of uh, the marketing department in the first place and other departments within the organization in the second place. But then here, there is another important thing that uh, the PR people they should be given targets and uh, they should be fixed objectives for the wish they have to work in a very organized manner. In other words, the activities uh, pursued by them could also have to be budgeted and uh, very specific goals could have to be uh, pointed out and laid down. Um, and then their performance could has to be evaluated against the certain key performance indicators. Uh, let me tell you here the, the fact of life it is not that easy to evaluate their performance as it is to uh, evaluate somebody else's performance within the marketing department or for that matter other departments for the simple reason that uh, there are uh, quite a few overlaps between uh, PR and marketing and given the fact that they work in very close coordination and in conjunction which is a word to be underlined with marketing it is quite very difficult at times to separate the two from each other. And therefore, the uh, cost associated to uh, the one uh, particular uh, the marketing activity uh, the, while evaluation takes place could be the one that also included certain portions of the PR activities. And uh, that's uh, something uh, that we have to live with. So it all depends on uh, how um, succinctly and how uh, specifically um, the marketing department comes up with uh, very well spelled out objectives for the PR people as well as the marketing people. Let us now get into the next component which is going to be an extension of what I have talked so far. This component is about how to build relationship with the media. I mean so much has gone on in terms of talking about the importance of relationship with the media. Uh, because media offers a lot of support to the organization and that support to the organization comes with the help of PR people. 
So what does it take uh, for the PRP people to develop good and positive relationship with, with the media? Uh, we know that uh, the media is very powerful and uh, the media plays an important role in shaping people's opinions and uh, having them take certain actions in favor of the organization. And given that, we have to take the media very seriously. Uh, how do we take the media seriously? Well, if that is the case, then we have to acknowledge the one fact that the media is uh, not just about a vehicle uh, which we use in order to transmit our message. It is something that we can call an audience. And it does happen to be a very important audience. And the next question is, if it happens to be an audience, then we've got to have an audience-centric approach toward the media. And that approach dictates that we try to understand what media is all about, what their values are, and what are the kind of rewards they seek in order to stay connected and engaged with the organization. Because if they are connected and engaged with the organization, then the organization can use that media I mean, any form of media to further connect with its audiences and to engage its audiences so that you can see how the chain works. It is extremely important to first understand what the media is all about and what are their values. Once convinced of the rewards, the media can get by developing a good relationship with the organization. Now I'm talking from their standpoint. Once they are convinced of that, they would be willing to feature the organization in a positive way. They will give us space because they will be convinced of the nature of the noble cause the organization is working on. And that is the ultimate objective of the PR department uh, to get certain space so that the organization stays alive in the eyes of the media and hence in the eyes of its own audiences. We know that uh, the media universally uh, has been covering uh, different uh, the social issues uh, all across the globe uh, for the betterment of the society. And uh, Pakistan is no exception. Although uh, we are in a very formative stage in terms of uh, the media giving attention to the social causes, uh, but the uh, chances are that uh, this thing will very rapidly catch on the way it has caught on. Uh, not uh, in just about the developed world, but also um, in the continent of Africa, just to give you one example. And um, this, uh, therefore, uh, is uh, an aspect that uh, has to be worked on extremely seriously by not just the PR people, but also by the marketing department of the organization. And um, let me here point out that uh, the areas that the media really picks up are uh, poverty, education, the health, environment, and uh, a few other uh, social issues that uh, they really inflict societies in general. And uh, they talk about interesting stories so that uh, the impact of those stories is positive on the society in terms of doing something for the society uh, for its betterment. And therefore, we here we could have to prove it to the media that uh, we do not happen to be a profit-driven organization. Uh, we rather are a non-profit entity that is involved in uh, working for a very noble cause. And uh, once they are convinced of that cause, there would certainly be some uh, the members of the media who would be sympathetic uh, toward that uh, particular cause. Now, I would say rather reiterate here uh, once again that uh, in order to be able to do all that and to achieve all that, we've got to understand the media first. How do we understand the media is a great question. Uh, we have to understand how they operate, what is it that inspires them, and uh, what is it that uh, excites them, and what really are their challenges. If we have a good understanding of their challenges and if we really can connect ourselves with them by having an understanding of those challenges, we really can draw a very close relationship between their interests and our cause.
So in other words, we have to first understand the kind of challenges that the media faces. Well, let me point out and enumerate the, those challenges the one by one. Whenever the media picks up an issue in regard to any social ailment or with regard to any other matter, because the media talks about the things that happen to be between two extremes of areas like local politics, international relations, education, health, crime, um, and even noble causes like the one that we are addressing as uh, the part of a non-profit organization. So whatever is it, they do have certain challenges they face and they have to meet those challenges. And the, what is it that we are supposed to do to create an enabling environment for them to meet those challenges is something that I'm going to talk about. Uh, only by creating that kind of environment that we can uh, win over the media and start developing relationships. So back to the challenges, the, what those really are. Well, in the first place, the media has got to sound like an expert on the issue they pick up and they talk about. And uh, they do that with uh, a lot of uh, clarity on the issue. That is the first and the foremost challenge they face. The second challenge is they, they've got to be very fast in collecting information and then analyzing it before they report it and report it accurately. The third challenge is they've got to be the first. I mean, every the media house tries to be the first in breaking the news or the story. And by doing that, they gain a competitive advantage. The next challenge they face is uh, that of accuracy. They've got to sound very accurate by not sounding off-center, meaning they've got to sound very reliable not taking sides. And then you see they have the challenge of uh, converting the information they have gathered into an interesting story uh, which will make their audience connect with the story, um, engage uh, itself with the story and uh, then get the reward of uh, some very interesting infotainment uh, without uh, having the perception of uh, that reward or without really getting that uh, the reward of infotainment the audience is not going to connect with uh, the um, media and stay engaged there. Uh, so in other words, uh, in order to uh, dilate uh, on the challenges that uh, media faces, uh, let me uh, say a few words uh, in support of that, that the media in the first place uh, has got to be an expert on the issue they talk about. And they have got to understand all the dimensions of the problem. Uh, while they do that, they've got to speak with a lot of confidence and conviction. And you will agree with me that by just getting a briefing from the PR people or the department of the organization, they collect and assimilate all that information to be able to talk about that with that confidence that I just said they should have. And the accuracy factor is of utmost importance because they would never like to transmit information which is erroneous. And the next Interesting uh, the challenge which really is uh, the very formidable uh, in the sense that uh, they have to create a high-pitched drama. This is uh, what the media does. Now, I'm not saying that uh, they always do that in relation to some noble causes also, uh, but generally they do with uh, most of the programs that uh, they carry out and the stories they pitch in uh, because uh, that really uh, makes their audience uh, stick with the program. Uh, they generally have uh, a great uh, proponent um, or um, uh, like they say protagonist uh, who is the main character of the, uh, the program or the story uh, who talks in favor of uh, that particular story and they also uh, pitch in an opponent or antagonist uh, who speaks generally against that. And they also like to show their stakes and like I said they don't really like to speak uh, in terms that may uh, make them look like off-center because they do not want to uh, appear as taking sides. And it is here that some uh, the tense, absorbing, opposing, and uh, I would say uh, the very dramatic moments take place. And it is these moments that really keep the audiences connected to the program and they stay engaged. And in that process, they get the reward 
of that exciting and valuable infotainment that I was talking about. And this is the ultimate uh, the end uh, they seek, the media as well as the over PR people. Now, what is it that we should be doing as uh, the PR people or marketing people? We have got to uh, take uh, some portion. It may be very the minuscule, the very, very limited. Uh, we may have the chief executive of the organization or the founder of the organization and the head patron of the cause say a few words uh, in between uh, that um, the program. But uh, as long as uh, we are in a position to pitch ourselves in, our objective is achieved. And toward that, uh, we've got to understand a in, in complete appreciation of how the media works and of what their challenges are. Because with this understanding of their of the challenges and of how to of the meet those challenges, we start appreciating their values. And with that of the understanding of their values, we appreciate what really drives their behavior. And understanding you know, what drives their behavior, we are in a position to start building relationships with them and uh, this goes uh, without saying uh, that uh, we have to create an enabling environment and to create that enabling environment uh, we have got to see that uh, we pitch a story that is extremely interesting now when i say that it has to be interesting it means it must tickle the fancy of the reporter or the media for that matter they must find it interesting and they must find it newsworthy which means it has the potential of conversion into something their audience will like the second important thing is that we come up with a story which is a true reflection of our positioning and our personality, meaning both the factors in relation to our program and as well as the organization. These uh, the factors uh, have to be a good part of uh, the message which we want gone across our audiences. And uh, if we stay true uh, to the positioning and uh, the personality of the uh, program and uh, give it uh, uh, a very interesting dimension which is newsworthy then we really can develop good relationship with the media because only then they will uh, put that uh, into uh, their uh, programs or in other words they will give us space and the fact is that uh, the organizations that uh, have the savvy of uh, developing positive relationships with the media are the ones that really stay on top in terms of execution of their programs it is not how noble the program is it also takes a lot many other factors and that is why we are into non-profit marketing and this certainly is one of the important factors responsible for bringing our organization and our cause into limelight while we the pitch in our story we've got to be very considerate of a couple of factors the one is that our sensitivity to what medium really is compatible with our cause at that particular point in time is of very high importance. Because we cannot go to the whole media at the same time. It could be radio at that particular point in time, it could be print medium or whatever it is, we've got to be very clear about that. Another factor that we must bear in mind is the a reporter or the media person that we are dealing with, we've got to be clear about his or her style of thinking, uh, the lifestyle and uh, the habits uh, that these people uh, carry. And uh, we can be very effective if uh, we take all those factors into account because they will be sympathetic toward the cause only if we can connect with them by appreciating um, what uh, their values are, uh, how they think, and uh, also um, aligning uh, yourself uh, in terms of uh, their lifestyle uh, in a subtle way uh, is uh, of uh, some importance. And um, therefore, uh, we've got to pick the right PR person uh, for this particular job because it has to be the connection of two right people from both sides. Then there's a question of timing.
When is the right time that uh, the organization should provide the media with uh, the vital information that I've been talking about? Well, it is not something which is provided to the media all of a sudden and then expecting them to come up with an interesting, exciting story. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, it happens like the following. We as marketing people or PR people keep on uh, collecting different bits and pieces of information as and when developments take place as part of the program. And those the bits and pieces are put together in a way that they end up as an aggregate story which can have some very interesting and newsworthy dimensions. Again, the question is, do we provide that aggregate story to the media, expecting them to just put that into the mainstream of their programs? No. Experts could go on to say that uh, the bits of information that we collect could, should also be the ones that we pass on to the media after doing some could, filtration. Of course, could, we do not pass on information to them in a way that, uh, could, it, and that it jumbles up uh, there uh, could, by not making uh, could, any sense to could, the people who are uh, not experts on the cause. And uh, they are not supposed to could, look into uh, the details of uh, could, how they can really uh, they make the head and tail out of the information they have. It is our job to create that enabling environment. And therefore, we should be sending those the bits and pieces to the media, which could automatically uh, should create a continuum at their end, uh, which uh, is uh, a cogent and coherent story. So they need our help to give uh, that story final shape and form. And uh, for that, we as marketing people as well as PR people have to stay ready at all times. So this is all about uh, the media relations and the importance of uh, the PR people getting into the picture. We are now getting into a component which uh, may sound very familiar to all of us. Uh, it is the channels of distribution. And uh, I can assume uh, very confidently that uh, all of us know uh, what channels are all about. Channels are the conduits could, between the manufacturers and uh, the ultimate consumers could, on the commercial side of marketing. Uh, could, we know that uh, commercial could, the marketers could have to create could, the certain tiers uh, could, between themselves and uh, the ultimate consumers could, so that they can facilitate uh, the passing on of the products to the ultimate consumer. So in other words, could, if they do not have those conduits or, or those channels, then the facilitation process of okay, making those products available to the ultimate consumers okay, becomes difficult. Going by the same principle, okay, we've got to do something similar in the non-profit sector as well. So in other words, okay, we've got to come up with okay, the certain ways and means okay, whereby okay, we can connect okay, with our audiences and uh, carry out our programs in terms of influencing their behaviors. And uh, I would like to uh, take uh, you back to the example that I gave in lecture number six in relation to the two different programs, the one uh, belonging to generic marketing and the other one to the social the marketing area. In the, both the examples, you will recall that uh, as the part of the four piece, I did talk about the place factor. And this place factor is the one which amounts to uh, a place utility. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the other piece, but rather I'm going to talk about the dispensary, which was the example of generic marketing. And the place of distribution happens to be the dispensary itself. Conversely, if you go by the other example of inoculation in which the medical teams uh, went to the remote areas in order to uh, propagate their uh, program to create awareness in the first place and then offering an alternative to their audiences so that uh, they could uh, follow through the whole program that was the uh, facilitation process they created for the audiences. So, Instead of okay, having their audiences come to them and uh, to talk about uh, the program, they okay, went to the audiences themselves okay, because they thought this is a preferable facilitation process and that is an example of uh, a facilitation uh, utility or the place of distribution. So just like uh, we have distributors and wholesalers and retailers on the commercial side, we have 
our own people with working on the, the distribution process depending on the nature of the program. If we are dealing with uh, a product like a dispensary, meaning a healthcare unit, we may not have too many units because there are certain dynamics to it in terms of expansion of the program. We get into the dynamics of services marketing because it brings in the factor of variability and also the um, adequacy or inadequacy of resourcefulness. If we do not really have the resources to have the two dispensaries, then we have to be content with one. That's my point here. And therefore, the distribution of the program is going to be confined to just the one dispensary. However, if we are in a position to expand that operation, we have the resources and we also have the expertise. We have total support from volunteers who are willing to help us carry out very efficiently and effectively effectively the our programs at um, multi uh, location uh, setups then uh, we uh, should go for that we have to keep one thing in mind that uh, facilitation process is not confined to the kind of examples that i cited from lecture number 6 in the non profit area facilitation can also take place when we are managing a one time event and uh, let me give you one example of uh, a one-time event. You are uh, running an organization which uh, wants to publicize a very noble uh, cause on the television and succeeds in uh, getting uh, media's attention who are willing to come to your premises and record a certain interesting and uh, very touching uh, aspects of the program to uh, telecast those uh, in one of the programs, it becomes your responsibility to make all the arrangements for the media to come to your premises and uh, do all those things very effectively and efficiently because you are creating a distribution channel for them. The reason I say distribution channel is because you have created a facilitation process for them where your audience, meaning the media, and you as the organization are meeting or have met. So in other words, we can define the distribution channels or this particular conduit uh, like the following. It is a place where the marketer and member or members of the audience or audiences meet in order to further the behavior influencing opportunities. That's where the channels of distribution is all about in the context of nonprofits. Now, this is uh, not to say that uh, we have uh, the channels uh, I've talked about and uh, we are not to follow the kind of channels that we find on the commercial side. As a matter of fact, many non-profit organizations could find it uh, very optimal and effective to uh, follow those channels and not just follow in concept but also in practice. They engage uh, members of uh, the distribution setup from the commercial side to distribute their products. Now, this basically is not the distribution of products which matters. It basically is the influencing of behaviors at the individual level, uh, meaning the influencing of the audiences that happen to be the ultimate consumer of that particular tangible product. Why they do that is going to be the topic of another component, but uh, the fact remains here is that uh, whatever programs are being undertaken by nonprofits, in most of the cases, they have to um, spread their uh, the human resource among so many different places. And uh, also another fact is that uh, they are not in a position to do so because of the lack of resourcefulness. They are uh, the short of financial resources, human resources, and uh, the many other associated resources that uh, they have to deploy in order to be effective. The examples can be numerous. We have to look for uh, different intermediaries that, uh, that can be beneficial toward our facilitation process, the process that we create for our audiences, and toward that uh, the we can use uh, so many different kinds of buildings as places, that we can use are different people as in intermediaries and these people are of course volunteers and uh, we can use uh, the transporters for example and uh, the important point here is that non-profit organizations could have to leverage their distribution processes 
with the buyer deciding who really could be a good distribution variable for their facilitation process. For example, they can go to public schools or uh, community health centers while they have to distribute uh, baby healthcare products. They can uh, get into some kind of cause relationship with transporters if they think uh, some tangible products are to be distributed along a certain geographical area and uh, cost partners uh, who are willing to provide that kind of help uh, could be good facilitators and this is uh, the where and this is how uh, you as the organization come into contact with, with uh, one of your audiences and uh, where you come into contact is the place of distribution and uh, you uh, develop that platform for your ultimate audience uh, to be influenced uh, because you create opportunities uh, for influencing those audiences at the place which is the facilitation point. So this is all for uh, the channels of distribution as an introduction uh, we should be talking about the strategic considerations uh, for deciding uh, what kinds of channels uh, we should have for nonprofits.